session. And our first speaker is Gualem uh, Kuida, uh, who has actually volunteered to um, kick this off because we were initially expecting Michael Gill, but uh, due to uh, uh, travel problems, he hopefully will make it by today, but he could make it by yesterday evening. And while uh, Gualem is setting up his uh, presentation, let me just point out that I don't know of any fire alarm scheduled today. So if there is a fire alarm, then this is a real one. There is actually a fire exit here, in case you haven't noticed, this is a stair going down. And please, I don't think we should use this unless there is a fire alarm, because it might actually set off a fire alarm if we use the door downstairs. And of course, there's also an exit there where you came in. So the, if you look carefully, the non-smoking sign has been switched off, but still, this is a non-smoking uh, environment here. So thank you for not smoking. Anyway, um, are we ready to go? Yes. So our first speaker is Walim Kuhida. Um, and he will speak about uh, equilibrium theory of uh, cumulus uh, parametrizations. Okay, uh, very good. Thanks a lot, uh, organizers, for this opportunity. I would like to thank uh, Newton Institute for the generous support for the program. Okay, so this talk, since I have only 20 minutes, so my goal is to try at least to convince you that tropical convection is interesting enough for mathematicians to work on it. And it has all the ingredients that uh, Tobias was talking about. It's multi-scale, it's hard, and it's important for climate, uh, for the climate system in general. So this, today I'm going to just talk about towards stochastic relaxation for the quasi-equilibrium theory of cumulus convection. So by the end of the talk, hopefully you would understand what I mean by all these words. So this work is joined with um, PhD student Etienne Leclerc. And this work actually, he did it as an undergrad summer research. Okay, so as I said, tropical convection is really um, multi-scale. So it's uh, tropics is dominated by multi-scale convective systems that interact with each other and that are spanning from the size of the individual convective cell, that's the cloud, to mesoscale systems of about 200 kilometers, uh, also known as super as, as cloud clusters, and there are super clusters that convective like a couple of waves. These are waves that are trapped around the equator and, and propagate along the equator. And there is also other waves that are even bigger. There are envelopes of the synoptic and mesoscale waves. And among them, there is something an animal called the Madden Julian oscillation. So I will try to explain what all that means. So these are unlike the weather in mid latitudes that's controlled by something that's known as baroclinic instability, if you may have heard about it. Uh, the Rossby waves that form, and these Rossby waves have um, low pressure systems and the low pressure, that's what controls the weather basically. If you know where the low pressure is, you know where it's going to rain. In the tropics, it's very complicated. It's not like that. The problem is the thing that's known as QG breaks down in the tropics. And what happens, you have these waves that actually interact with convection and there is interactions across these scales back and forth. And the big problem is that climate models have resolutions that stop here. So they don't catch this, they don't catch this. So they cannot simulate this waves and they cannot simulate the planetary scale MJO. And the MJO has an impact on the climate and weather, not just in the tropics, but also in, in, on the globe through lots of um, teleconnection patterns that you may have heard. 
So just a little, some more words about the MJR. So this is a satellite picture of clouds. You can think of it as clouds. This is just minus temperature from the top of the satellite. And what it shows here is an average from 2.5 south to 7.5 north of this uh, signal. And it's plotted as known as a half mirror diagram in space and time. So this is greenish to greenish. This is the longitude. And this is time going down from January 1st to May 1st. You see that's one, two, three, four months there. And that's the Madden Julian oscillation as moving as an, an envelope of smaller scale waves. These are the synoptic scale Kelvin waves. And inside of them, you will see um, what, are, what are known as, as cloud clusters that move in usually in the opposite direction. So that's all how things interact. So is this for this is for what latitude or no? What? This is this is the equator. This is averaged um, around the equator from two five south to seven point five. Ah, okay, okay. It's, it's an average about, okay. In, in the latitude, right? And this is just longitude from Greenwich to Greenwich. But this, this is basically the Indian Ocean. So this thing starts in the Indian Ocean and moves across the maritime continent as, as a big giant wave. So mm. in the season, you will have like four or five of those. So typically they're more active in winter. In summer, you have mostly monsoons, the Indian monsoon mostly in that region, or South Asian monsoon. Okay, just now a little word about convection, why we do convection the way we do it and clouds in the tropics. So before people thinking about clouds in the tropic has been only these giant cumulonimbus clouds and maybe some shallow clouds that are trapped below the inversion layer. It, it happens that actually there is a third type of clouds that are known as cumulus congestus that were not known before this paper. And these are basically related to three stability layers in the atmosphere. So there is the trade and wind inversion, which you may have heard about, that basically traps shallow clouds. So basically prevents, inhibits convection to, to go deep because there will be like an, a barrier for, uh, for, 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 for raising parcels. It will be like, they will have negative buoyancy here. But those are lucky to overcome this sim layer. We make it to a dry environment. So then they don't make it up beyond the zero degree Celsius, where they can get a boost of buoyancy from freezing. But this now then you will form what's known as congested clouds. And then the congested clouds moisten the environment that basically then precondition it later on plumes that come can make it above the freezing level and then go up to the level of neutral buoyancy up to the tropopause. They don't all reach the tropopause, but they mostly all do that. So that's, and then the third, and that's where the tropopause gets a very stable layer. Okay. It happens that this Three clouds that we're talking about are present in all the systems, starting from the mesoscale systems that we're talking about. If they are moving in, in this direction or moving in this direction or in this direction, they are both have to start from congestus deep and then we get this stratiform angle of clouds that followed by rain that evaporates and precondition and, and then basically stop convection and allow the system to move. Or if they move this way, the same thing, start for shallow, and just as deep stratiform. But the synoptic scale waves, you have the same, the same issue of the, also the same thing. So this wave is moving this way, this wave is moving this way. And this is the Martin Julian oscillation that has also the same type of clouds. So that's why we designed the, uh, the stochastic multi-cloud model, basically based on 
the building block of this cycle of conduction starts with shallow cumulus, deepens to deep to, to cumulus congestus when the atmosphere is dry. And when the atmosphere is moist, you get deep convection, and then you get stratiform, you get stratiform rain, evaporates, cools the, uh, the boundary layer, and then restores the inversion layer. And then you get shallow cumulus again, and then the cycle is good. And of course, this is not a deterministic cycle. It cannot be. If it was a deterministic cycle, you cannot have waves that are mesoscale, scale, synoptic scale, and planetary scale to have all the same structure and yet they are embedded in each other. There is no way you can do that. If you have bricks that look like elephants, you, can use, you cannot use these bricks to build an elephant. That's not, that's not possible unless it's stochastic. So then in a stochastic sense, then you get more of these clouds in front, more of this in the middle and more of this in the back. So then you can build your elephant that way. Okay, so this, this, this model, we put it in a simpler parameterization in the NSAP climate forecasting system. That's, the, that's the, the model that the Indian Institute for Tropical Meteorology used operationally to predict monsoon and, and do uh, uh, subseasonal um, weather predictions. And it's funded by the National Monsoon mission of India. And what we saw is that we saw a big improvement of these waves that we're talking about. So now this picture is a little complicated. You may not be familiar. So this is from observations. This is from the satellite picture I showed you. What you see here is the spectral power, which means this is wave number instead of being the longitude. This is now in Fourier space. And this is frequency instead of being time. What you see from these waves, the giant uh, blob of MJL becomes this delta function, K, in this Fourier space. And these are the Calvin waves that we're talking about. And these are known as Rossby waves, and these are two day waves, some of it as the, are the mesoscale uh, clusters there. Some of the other mesoscale structures are way up, uh, like a, a two day to one day uh, waves. So now this is the control, the default CFS model that uses what's known as the Arakawa Schubert parameterization to represent clouds. That's how we represent this picture. Okay. And now this is exactly what we get when we put the stochastic model in. So I'll just leave the picture there for you to appreciate it. I don't want to spoil it by telling you what it is. Okay. So you can see the Madden Julian oscillation. Here it's much, much slower actually than in the observation. Kelvin power is restored. And this is the anti-symmetric part of the spectrum. These waves are known as the mixed Rossby gravity waves. The control model doesn't have them at all. The stochastic model captures them. And all the idea is from this building block of congestus Stratiform. And the time series, this is the distributions of rainfall as they depend on the outgoing long wave radiation and how strong the rain is. So, outgoing long wave radiation is basically how much radiation goes back to space. If there are clouds, there is less radiation going back to space. Lower OLR means cloudy atmosphere, cloudy sky. This is the distribution from the observation. This is for just the summer monsoon region. This is the whole tropics annually. And that's what the CFS model, the default model shows. And that's what the stochastic model shows. Okay. Now, this is the Madden Julian oscillation. This is a movie just to entertain you how it's observed, how it's simulated by the stochastic model, and how it's simulated by the CFS default. Well, this is just to entertain you. You can look. 
And if I didn't tell you this is filtered about the MJO, you might not recognize it. Okay. So now. Um, so what do the colors say? Sorry, this is. This is voila. This is basically precipitation. The red is precipitation. Um, it's either, yeah, the, the red is actually all going over vegetation. The blue uh -huh. is rain. Mm. You can think of it as, as, as rainfall. The blue is rainfall. So this is basically a positive anomaly, and the red is negative anomaly, where it's drier. Mm -hmm. Drier than kind of at average. Yes. Yeah. Okay. This is a, this is like a filtered uh, around the wind. So that's basically it starts in the Indian Ocean, it moves across the maritime continent and dies in the Western Pacific. That's the Madden Julian oscillation. Okay, so if you're interested, this is just publicity mm -hmm. for my book. You can find all this in the this volume of the Mathematics of Planet Earth series. So now let's go back to the uh, to the basics. Why this is a problem? Why we have a problem? So why cumulus parameterizations and what's cumulus parameterizations? Why do we need to parameterize convection? So these are the equations that normally should represent everything. So that's the uh, familiar with the momentum equations. This is the vertical momentum equation. This is potential temperature conservation of energy. This is water vapor, cloud water, rain. The one thing you notice is that this C is, is stands for condensation of water, that's phase change. And the E is the evaporation of water from liquid back to, to vapor. And that's from vapor to liquid. So what you see is that when you get condensation, you lose vapor. You create liquid at the same time you heat the atmosphere. When you get evaporation, you gain vapor, you lose uh, water, liquid water, both rain and cloud, and you cool the atmosphere. And the rainwater depends on basically the rate of conversion from cloud to rain. And of course, there is a precipitation, um, like a, a, that's the that's basically the form, uh, the terminal velocity of droplets, of rain droplets. So how the, the rain falls to the ground. Climate models cannot solve these equations, impossible. One reason is because all these terms in red are very fast, okay? So climate models have to filter these equations and because they use grid sizes that are huge, they cannot resolve the clouds of more than 10 kilometers. So therefore, what you do, you resolve a filtered system, and then you have the, per the, the perturbation like in turbulence theory that you need to come up with uh, a closure. But basically these are the equations that kind of models, okay? You see now all the cloud equations disappear. You still have an equation for water vapor. Then you have to come up with a model for this fluxes, this turbulent fluxes, and also how to cope with this condensation and evaporation rates, and of course, how to find rain. And that's why you need what's known as a parameterization. So you need to come up with a function that will depend only on the large scale variables and some parameters. And of course, as a mathematician, you can think of these parameters as stochastic variables or anything you want. And basically then if you can cook up a nice formula, then you are in business. And that's the business that meteorologists were doing since they started doing climate models. Okay, and that's the idea. Basically, you, you take the big tree parks, you have clouds inside, and then you introduce mass flux, how much mass goes inside the cloud and down, up and down, and then you basically then form these turbulent fluxes 
my my lunch of clues inside each cloud and collecting all the mass fluxes. And then you come up with, with some uh, formula for the, uh, it's not simple. So you can write down the equation of conservation of mass inside the cloud, where sigma is just the area fraction of the cloud or the cloudiness. Cloud of type uh, I, you can like, separate them into different types of clouds. You get that equation where E is known as the entrainment and D is the training, how much mass goes into the cloud, and how much mass goes outside the cloud. The early parameterizations, unfortunately, don't solve that equation with the time derivative because it's too hard, because it's not closed. They solve a steady state equation. And that's basically how they uh, overcome the problem of the closure, the first one. And then, of course, then you get uh, a, a model for the mass flux, basically, that like for each cloud type, this is that the lambda will be the type of the cloud, and it will be some, some shape function that's just an exponential, really. And then you get the, 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 the entrainment and detrainment, and you get the mass flux from all that once you set up this. But then what's missing is you still need a closure. You need to know the mass flux at the base of the cloud. That's MB. And that's where it, it's a little tricky. So Arco and Schubert worked out some function how to figure out the, the cloud-based mass flux. You can write down the, uh, the kinetic energy of the cloud and solve this equation where A is known as the cloud work function, which is nothing just the integral of the buoyancy from the base of the cloud to the top. And A, you can write down the equation. It turns out to be this integral differential equation where lambda stands for the cloud type. So you have an infinite number of cloud types basically, and then you get this integral differential equation. The problem now is that that also is not closed. It's not closed. So what they do, they assume what's known as quasi equilibrium that this time derivative is zero. So then you get this simpler equation and then they invert it. It happened that this actually is in pose two because the K is not necessarily invertible. So there are lots of recipes. There is the relaxed Arakawa Schubert, Zach McFarland, there are lots of people who work, uh, smart people who work on this problem to overcome this problem of composites. Okay. But what I'm interested in, there is an idea that's put forward by Pam and Randall. Instead of that, so they introduced another way to close the equation by basically just writing down what the, the dissipation of kinetic energy is, just to say it's proportional to the kinetic energy itself, about some time scale to D. And they work out some math basically saying that this is the, uh, the vertical velocity inside the cloud, and this is the vertical velocity in the environment, and this is the average. And sigma is just the area fraction of the cloud. And then the assumption that the sigma is small and the vertical velocity inside the cloud is much bigger than the vertical velocity in the environment, you can basically then uh, come up with this closure, which is basically saying that this kinetic energy scales as the square of the cloud-based mass flux, which is basically makes sense as, as the um, kinetic energy uh, of, of the cloud. So, and there are other alternatives actually, Plant and Yano uh, have some alternatives for this. And, and rope plant I think is from where it is. <coughs> so then we come up and we can write down this system of equations that's basically closed. And it, it turns out to be just an equation of this form, which is just a harmonic oscillator with damping. It's a damped uh, oscillator. So this just give you an idea. This is just uh, some, some technical math that uh, my student did. Just look at the scalings. It turns out that if you look at this equation, the scaling are all 
proportional to each other. So there is no way you can say that this time derivative or that time derivative is small. It's not possible, especially not at the time scale of what you have. And the time scale is basically um, 1000 seconds, which is like 20 minutes, which is bigger than the time scale that GCM seems, which is 10 minutes usually. So, so instead of that equation, so what's missing here is basically then we get this um, dissipate uh, the, the, the uh, basically a damped oscillator. Instead of the damped oscillator, which is good in a way, it still, it still gives some memory, then actually there is more to that. What Penn and Rangel assumed is that the J is only dissipation, it only dissipates energy from the clouds. But if you allow the clouds to interact with each other, like they do, you can set up K to be a matrix of this sort. If you have either two clouds or three clouds. And what we find is that instead of a damp oscillator, you have a lots of different behaviors. So this picture shows the eigenvalues of that um, linear of the system of the ODE and the red are the, are the uh, imaginary parts and the blue is the real parts. As you can see, if I vary G11, which is just the diagonal term, and as the diagonal term increases, everything goes stable. But when the diagonal term is small, actually that system is, is unstable. So it's impossible to get equilibrium. If I increase J12, that's the off diagonal term, you start with stable. And if I start here, for instance, with J11, then it becomes unstable and, and so on. And what we found is that the cloud cloud interactions make the system even unstable. So basically it's not likely to have any equilibrium, quasi equilibrium the theory is just wrong. So now um, I think I'm, so now I'm just going to, to replace the, the equation for the area fraction with an equation that come up from the stochastic model. I'm going to skip this. The stochastic model is really a Markov jump process. And, um, and you can write down the mean field equation and the alphas are the interactions between clouds. I can actually assume only one cloud and then I have this equation instead. So now instead of the, just the two equations for A and M, I have also an equation for sigma for the area fraction. And the two parameters that are important are the U0, which is the interaction between neighbors, the cloud neighbors, and F, which is the forcing from the large scales. And H here represents basically convective inhibition. So what we see as we vary F, this is the equilibrium value of sigma. It increases for large F, you have large area fractions. For small F, you have small area fractions. And the system goes a Hopf bifurcation. You go from a state where everything is stable then the, you have the two eigenvalues that are uh, complex conjugate cross the real line, become unstable and stable again. When you reach the state where the, the cloud, basically the column is saturated with clouds, it becomes stable. When you are in a situation where the cloud is very small, it's stable. But all the situation where you have lots of clouds inside the column, it's actually unstable. And as I move, I get, I, I see, I think I'm, I'm right on time. So if I, if I move to, if I increase at U0, I get multiple equilibria. And some of them, again, it's stable. 
and all three equilibria are not stable. The middle equilibrium is always unstable. And then you go to a state where it's, and then you get this nice behavior. You get limit cycles for small U0, and for large U0, you get chaotic behavior. And, and if I change F from six to seven, I go from this limit cycle type to again, the depth oscillations that was in random. So basically the idea is that, and also if I change the, if I have slow oscillations of F, I get this kind of behavior with F oscillates fast, you get this kind of behavior in flux in the upper equilibrium. And you get lots of other equilibria. So you get this kind of limit cycles. You get this kind of chaotic behavior. And basically the idea is that the system we wrote down is like the Laurel system for moist dynamics. I'm just going to, to uh, summarize. So Panorando reacts with the equilibrium leads to depth oscillations when cloud cloud interactions are inured. If we include the cloud cloud interactions, we get this what we call multi cloud instability and all kinds, and you get uh, growth with the interaction strength, et cetera. And with the area fraction is made to vary as, as an equation, you get chaotic dynamics with the dynamical and structural regimes that are controlled by the balance between the internal potential and the large scale forcing. This is a demonstration that quasi equilibrium is far from being realistic. And the stochastic multi cloud approach offers a way to overcome the quasi equilibrium closure dilemma with rich dynamical and structural behaviors that can represent various regimes of subgrid variability due to organized connection. So, thank you. Thank you very, very much for this uh, nice talk. We have uh, about five minutes for questions. I'm looking at the organizers. Okay, so the floor is open for questions. Um, like, uh, please, yes. Thank you very much for this nice overview talk. Uh, I have like a question about like the, how you, you bridge the two. So you have like the, the full set of equations, yes. right? And you have your uh, toy models mm -hmm. that are, you know, so you derived mean, from you mean the large scale yes. dynamical core. Yeah, that's yes. handled by the GCM. You yeah, know, that's I know. Yeah. But the the the, the multi stability. Oh, you just you talk just about this. Yes, yeah. the yeah. multi stability to obtain yeah. in the in yeah. the toy model. Yeah. So do you observe this uh, multi stability? Do you have hints? I know it's very difficult to analyze this big more this this full set of equation. But do you have hints? And if yes, like you know, those when you have like multiple equilibria, yes. would it correspond to let's say the the congestus, the dip, and the and the yeah, indeed, indeed, right? indeed. And, yes. and then and then so, you could imagine that you have stochastic so transition in between the, them. The multiple equilibria represent two regimes that are observed in nature yeah. of convection. There is the regime of known as popcorn convection. We have clouds that pop up everywhere. At, mm -hmm very intermittently and the regime of organized convection where you see the waves I was talking about in the beginning right? these giant waves that move across the, 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 the tropical regions and that are basically full the whole grid with convection and GCM suffer from not being able to capture these kind of waves because the parameterizations they use they start from the start they assume that the area fraction is small they throw away everything, and then they go to the quasi-equilibrium theory, which is valid only for that popcorn convection regime. And they're never able to represent correctly the organized convection. The organized convection. Therefore, yes. for instance, you know, or like we know that the over like the, the this marine marine stato communus, for instance, yes. they can organize into open convective yeah, cells yeah, yeah. or closed convective yes. cells. Yeah. So this would correspond to the hop part. This, this is actually for deep convection. For I deep. have another work. 
for um, strongly cumulus convection where you don't need the three cloud types, you just need one cloud type. Okay. And basically that happens when the, the inversion layer is very strong and it cannot be overcome. And then, so you get the organization happens just to the strata criminal. You have like a paper on the. On yes, the, yes. On I, have, I have a paper. On this on case. Yes. Okay. And you and do I observe. It you. Yes, yeah, please. Yeah. You yeah. do observe like the. the yeah, yeah. We, we, we observe. The uh, open cells. And... We, we observe uh, closed cells, open cells, and, and convection rolls. Oh, yeah. And, and actually, just in the stochastic model without even dynamics. So it's, it's really uh, the conundrum of trying to represent something without really solving the equations. And what's the, sorry, one, one more thing, like it's- yeah, just, let's, let's look, we have enough time, I think, but okay. let's just ask if there's another, if somebody else has a question. Okay. But, yeah, there are other questions, but, but we have okay. time for your question, no worries. Mike, please. Okay, um, I just want to make sure I really understood this. So, <clears throat> so you still have, um, your parameterization is stochastic rather than the traditional ones, but it's still, Operating purely on a grid column basis, as it, as it doesn't, um, so you have a more complicated way of representing what's happening with an individual grid column, which supplements the governing equation. Is yes. that correct? Yeah. You still got, so I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical whether that's really capable of dealing with the situation, especially when you have a, a relatively high resolution GCMs or coming down towards the tens of kilometers of resolution, which obviously we yeah. have quite a lot so and that assumption of local mass balance, which really built into that way of doing it, isn't just increasingly wrong as you go to that higher resolution. Yeah, yeah okay. So, so that's basically what you are mentioning is, is really important. There are two things. There is the time memory, which is always here. So the, the subgrid scale model has a time memory. And there is also uh, near, near well, I guess horizontal nearest neighbor interactions that also happen in, in, in the columns that we didn't actually put in the simulations that I showed you before, but that's just easy to do. So if you go to GCMs with 10 kilometer resolutions, then you have to, to do these kind of models with local interactions. So basically the, the grid columns can talk to each other. Yeah, I'm a little bit skeptical about whether <laughs> I expect you may need to... Well, you can be skeptical, but the results are here. I can show you. Not sort of clearly well, better. If you've yeah. got better results, that's... Yeah, kind of if you can, I challenge you to find a GCM that can represent the MJ on like this. Yeah, okay. I challenge you. Okay, well... well, I, well I, I challenge you. Yeah, okay, well, the main point... I'm I challenge you. Okay, well. <laughs> <laughs> I challenge everyone in the world. Okay, I'll, I'll, I would talk to you more outside, but that'll do for now. <laughs> okay. Any more questions? <laughs> is there is there was another question from somewhere there? Yeah, please go ahead. Um, you said it's a stochastic model. Uh, is, do, do you discretize stochastic PDE or is this? Uh, no, 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 no. It's so it's more know? like an, an Eisen type model. Yes. It's like um, it's it's a, a particle system. Yes. So you have particles interacting with each other, and you collect basically the field infraction. Mm. And the field fraction is the area of convection, basically the area fraction of convection. It's the it's understanding of, of the when you do an ensemble, do you have ensemble runs with this model and do you understanding of we, of we don't run ensembles, we don't need to run ensembles. The way we run it is through uh, MCMC. So basically you run your MCMC and you basically collect, you just need to collect the last. Uh, so, so it's really, you run it as a two a couplet system. You have your GCM and you have your small scale system that run in parallel for each time scale, uh, each time step. You run the GCM for mm -hmm. one time step and you run the stochastic model for one time step. So it's just um, kind of Poisson type process. Okay. Um, it's the Markov chain, right? Yeah, nice. Do you know how to simulate Markov chains? That's how we do it. Wow. Hey, done. So looking at the simulation right now, the, so the, the multi-cloud model, it's, it's really built for tropical convection. So are you applying this only in a zone in, in the tropics? 
in this in this actually test we 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 did the same airflow and we didn't it didn't it didn't seem to be a problem right so what happens outside the tropics is that all the rain is picked up by the large scale model basically large scale precipitation the convection really is only active mostly only in the tropics of course there are regions in the mid arides like montaneous regions and where there are storms that are convective, these are cap captured by the, the, the by the convection characterization. The rest is really just large scale rain. Uh, John, yeah. So I mean, I had a question following on the from the first one. I mean, in the multi cloud instability results, how, how yeah. do you, how can you demonstrate that they are kind of robust? Because obviously you can vary the, the toy model and the number of yeah, I, cloud I, components and so on, but you know, how, how can we determine what, what are robust results from that? System? I don't understand what you mean by robust. Well, relevant to the atmosphere. Oh, okay. That's what that's the term of robust. Uh, so your question is basically similar to Mikhail's question. Yes, yeah, right. Yeah. Yes. These regimes of multiple equilibria exist in nature. Clouds do interact with each other. This is an observation evidence from this picture here. I suppose put it, putting it another way, given, given a set of competing models that you can construct, how would you work out which was the best one? By, I guess by experiments. You need to hook it to a GCM, run it, and see if it produces the right just like what I showed, I mean, you have all these waves in the tropics, can your GCM produce them? Okay. This is the question. <clears throat> right. Um, I think we are ready for the first coffee break. Um, so let's thank Gervo once again.